Good evening, everyone. My name is Devin Rhodes, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for Evolution of Content and Today's Athlete with Bill McCullough. Also from Susquehanna University, we have President Jonathan Green and our lovely First Lady, Lynn Buck, Melissa Kimura, and also John Foltz. Um, before I turn the program over to Matt, um, we will use the Q&A and the chat features to ask questions um, at the end of Bill and Matt's conversation. Uh, we also had a couple of comments um, or questions submitted, uh, pre-submitted, so thank you very much for sending those our way. Uh, and now it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce um, an amazing guy, um, our moderator for this evening, Matt Curran, class of 1992. Um, at Susquehanna, Matt majored in um, business finance, and he is currently the senior vice president at Sampo International, and he is also a member of our alumni board. Um, take it away, Matt. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Devin. I am not esteemed at all. You wait, you wait until we get the bill to see how esteemed I am. <laughs> so it's really my pleasure to introduce to everyone, Bill McCullough. Bill is a 1991 graduate of Susquehanna and he was a communications major, communications public relations major, also a running back on the football team, also a station manager of WQSU, also a Land Kai brother. So pretty cool stuff at Susquehanna. Today, Bill is an executive vice president of content at FaZe Clan which is the most popular gaming and youth culture brand in the world. He has held various executive positions uh, in other companies, including the NFL, HBO Sports, and GoPro Entertainment. So today you're gonna see firsthand about Bill's incredible passion and energy for his work. And trust me, you don't have to take it from me. He has won 11 Emmys. He was also recognized in 2020 as one of Adweek's top 100 creatives. And in 2018, he won and a Susquehanna University Alumni Achievement Award. So Bill, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here, Devin. Thank you very much. Uh, always love to uh, talk about the days at Susquehanna. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, let's start us off before we jump into your professional life. Tell us a little bit about your Susquehanna story and maybe what got you there and what kept you uh, at Susquehanna. Yeah, um, you know, look, it, it was, um, I had never heard of Susquehanna before, you know, before I went there. And uh, it was a much different time, Matt, as you know. Uh, it's not like today. We didn't really have the internet. It wasn't really easy to visit schools or, or do any of that stuff. Um, and I remember that uh, football coach, uh, Ron Iori, uh, I think that was his name, Iori or Ioli, uh, can't remember his, his name, but he came to visit our school um, uh, in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And we just had a great conversation. And uh, I went up and I, I toured Susquehanna and saw Seelands Grove and the campus. And, uh, you know, I was either going to go to Susquehanna or Catholic University, really two different kind of settings, you know, sure. Catholic University is down in DC in that area. Um, and uh, really wanted to go to Susquehanna. I, I fell in love with the campus. Um, the football team with Coach Reese was like, you know, uh, really top in the country at that point. Um, and just, it just felt like home to me, you know, and as soon as I got there, uh, I knew I'd made the right choice. And, uh, yeah, my time at Susquehanna was, you know, college is difficult, right? I mean, you, you grow, you learn. Um, when I found out that they had a, a radio station, I, I had never even thought about that, you know, before, but it was something that I was really attracted to. Um, and obviously got really involved in, and really kind of was the key to, to, to the start of my career. Um, I had no idea at the time. Um, like we had, we had talked about, Matt, I was, you know, I, I did the morning show with a guy named Pat Kosin, um, my junior year, and then Tim Slifer, my senior year. And we used to do appearances at the, at the, uh, the mall and at the old trail Inn, And so it was great. It, it, we had a blast and, uh, and really the, the radio station was so impressive. I mean, 50,000 Watts, I think it was 50,000 Watts, but it covered like a third of the state, right. um, in central Pennsylvania. So it was an amazing experience from football to radio. And then of course, some of my best friends still today, uh, are, are from my college days. Well, that's great. I uh, echo those sentiments too. Uh, some of my best friends are also uh, from Susquehanna and my wife too. So I think she's great. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your background, Bill. We'll jump into, you know, the, the phase part of this conversation. You know, of course, for everyone uh, here, 
I did have to Google this and do a little research because it's a little bit beyond my comfort zone. But, you know, it is one of the top esport companies and uh, biggest gaming organizations out there. So Forbes has you guys valued at over $300 million. So it's a pretty big company and you have over $40 million in annual revenues. And so at a high level, you know, keep it high or maybe dumb it down for me uh, at least is give us a little understanding about what do you guys do and what do you do for them? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and look, before I worked there, I had no idea. I have to say that, like we said yesterday, Matt, I'm way more popular with my friends' kids now um, because of FaZe. Um, so that's been interesting. But FaZe is really, look, gaming's been around. I mean, it, it, you know, we played games. We played games at Susquehanna. You know, Tecmo Bowl was a big Saturday night activity around uh, the fraternity house. Um, but it really changed, right? It changed once Xbox Live came in, in, into play, right? And that really started this social component to, to gaming that has really evolved into what youth culture is today. And so when you look at what FaZe Clan does, of course, there's the esports component of it. We, we own some of the, the top esports teams in the industry. Call of Duty is probably um, our signature game. Uh, we have a team, Atlanta FaZe, who is probably going to win the championship this year. But we're also into Rocket League. We're also into Valorant. Um, and so there, there's about 10 games that we're into. Um, but the most interesting thing about FaZe Clan is, is it's this cross-section between gaming and celebrity and, and lifestyle youth culture, right? And I, I, it's hard to nail down exactly what it is, but um, it's all part of this youth creator culture, right? That, that is just so rampant today because of probably social media. And, you know, like I, I, I my kids have grown up with cameras and, and they're able to edit, you know, by the time they're in, you know, kindergarten. I, I joke at Susquehanna, as great as it was, you know, we were, I remember Bob Gross drew on a blackboard and he said, hey, this is what a switcher looks like, <laughs> you know? And then, we, then we'd go with our VHS camera and then we'd do like hand-to-hand -hand combat trying to edit videotape with VHS, you know? I mean, it's completely different today. Day. And so when you look at gaming, gaming is really the common denominator that exists in, in this new culture, right? Um, we just brought Kyler Murray, you know, the starting quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals, former number one pick. We signed him to FaZe Clan on Monday. I'll show you a video, video later. But the thing that kind of, um, again, it, yeah, he's an NFL quarterback, but he's also a gamer. He's been gaming since he was five years old. And so what FaZe Clan has done is really looking to, to build a company that is, is uh, made from creators, you know, to give them a platform to not just uh, make it about FaZe Clan, but to empower these creators because these creators have become brands and distribution points themselves, right? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as, a, as we get into the athlete and how it's changed. Um, but that is something that... Um, it's hard for, for this, our generation to wrap our heads around that. Um, and I, I, honestly, there are days when I'm sitting there and these guys are talking, I'm like, what, what the hell are you talking about? You know, I, don't, I don't quite understand it, but that's the exciting part too, right? It's, it's the wild West. And as we look at platforms emerging and traditional platforms like linear television on the decline, um, and these streaming wars that are emerging, you know, it, the bottom line is that all of our consumption behaviors have changed in, in a huge way. Um, and this youth generation, this youth culture is really driving a lot of this change and forming these new habits that are affecting large companies. Uh, I'm not sure if all you guys followed the GameStop Robin Hood, uh, uh, you know, thing that went down a couple of uh, months ago or so, but it's the power of, of social media and this youth culture that is really kind of flipping the script on, in a lot of different areas. And so FaZe Clan is at the forefront of, of this movement. And I think when we think of gamers, I think the, the stereotypical image that we have is, you know, some kid sitting in his basement, you know, who hasn't eaten or whatever. But that's not what these these kids are today. You know, FaZe Clan is really the first generation of these rock star gamers. I mean, some of these guys are driving Lamborghinis and hanging out with Drake. And like, you know, it is really um, this hype beast culture that is merging with youth and gaming and music. Um, you know, there's a digital media state of the union that was put out by Deloitte, Deloitte a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it is, you know, saying that 
all of these kids, this whole culture are gamers. And when they're not gaming, they're streaming music. And so you're looking at companies like Comcast who are rethinking their strategy as it comes to traditional sports and really doubling down in the gaming and music uh, uh, verticals there. So I think we're in store for a, uh, a huge, massive sea change when it comes to how we get our entertainment, um, wh what role gaming plays in this, and some of these other companies that you'll see that are really going to emerge in the next five to 10 years that will become powerhouses. Pretty cool. So when you talk about all this, one of your most valuable assets has to be the gamer or the influencer themselves. So how do you actually attract them to your company? And then how do you retain them at your company? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so a little history about FaZe. Um, it was started, you know, probably 10, 12 years ago by a group of, uh, of kids who were really doing trick shots on, on Call of Duty, right? And they do these amazing trick shots. And, um, and so they were playing together and they had this, this camaraderie and then they, they decided to move into a house together. Right. And that was really the first kind of gaming house that now all these gaming companies have houses. You see, you know, of course, the the, the hype house and, um, uh, you know, on TikTok and, and YouTubers. Now the house thing is, is a huge uh, kind of content factory for for all of this for youth, really. Um, and so we have 90, I think between 80 and 90 um, uh, members on phase. And uh, they started to do probably about four or five years ago, something called phase five, where they would open the submissions and, and they would just have everybody kind of submit and they'd go through this process of challenges and, and content um, kind of assignments to get down and recruit to, so that there's a final five. Um, last year, I think they had over 200,000 open submissions um, when they opened it, the registration. Um, and they got down to the final five in January and the numbers and the engagement around th that activation was just enormous. Um, so that comes straight from the community. You know, it is really the gaming community and there's such a, a, a desire to be associated with face, but then to really level that up. Um, we've got, like I said, Kyler Murray, this whole friends of phase, um, because what's happened is this gaming, uh, uh, um, this gaming um, community has grown up now. And yes, they're gamers, but they're also professional quarterbacks. They're professional basketball players like Ben Simmons. Um, they're actors. They're artists like Lil Yachty and uh, and and Offset. Um, and so you know, it, it's crazy because at the NFL. When I was at the NFL, we really had to chase guys to be like, hey, Todd Gurley, you know, we want you to be in this commercial, you know, here it's incoming, right? Like we, we get called, hey, this is, this is offset. I want to be part of it, you know, or Kyler Murray. Hey, how can I be part of FaZe Clan? And so it's really amazing and it's great to have incoming calls instead of the outgoing calls chasing everybody. But it's such a, um, we've made such an impact uh, in, in this community that people want to be part of it. And so we're able to bring that, that celebrity factor into it. Um, but the, the cool thing is, is like, you know, when Kyler Murray comes on, he's just as like, you know, enamored with these guys that have been playing Call of Duty because they're amazing at what they do as they are with him playing, being a quarterback, you know? So um, it, it's a very, very cool dynamic to see um, the respect that um you know that that these gamers command around because they're the best at what they do um and so taking that and infusing this lifestyle um at the same time is just been incredible so it, you know the recruiting has not been a problem cool. it, you know honestly it's it's how do we leverage you know all of those all of the talent across all of the channels and, and i think that when you look at the amount of eyeballs that we have across all of our creator channels it's over 350 million so that's a very powerful marketing machine that once you, how do you pull actually, all those levers how do you and monetize actually, that I, I, exactly right um and honestly you know I'm not sure we've actually figured it all out, you know, how to pull all those levers at the same time. So that's part of, of what my role is. Um, yeah. Content plays a huge piece of that too. So, so the yeah. content is really coming in from the, the influencers and the gamers themselves. So they are both a, a talent, if you will, as well as the content provider. 
hundred percent, right? And, and it's also it, it's not only that it's coming into phase channels. They're they're very successful um, and monetizing on their own channels, so they become distribution points, right? Um, on Twitch, you know, uh, one of our guys, um, Nick Merks, who is um, he's probably one of the most successful streamers out there. Um, he every day. He streams to probably 65 or 75,000 concurrent view, uh, viewers at one time. That's like streaming to SoFi Stadium every single morning, you know, <laughs> and that's what he does. The, uh, two weeks ago um, or last week, they put a new map out on Call of Duty. He was pulling in 475,000 concurrent streams at one time. Oh. I mean, these are massive numbers. That's more than watch the, watches a Dodgers game in an entire week. You know, and he's pulling this in at the same time. So the, the reach that these guys have um, is immense. And and that's why and they monetize that. You know, I mean, Nick Merckx, you want Nick to do anything. It's seven figures to get him to do something right because he's his own network. Sure. Um, but that's where it's going. And so part of the challenge is how do we incentivize these guys to, you know, get off of their channels and really kind of get behind a collective phase channel, you know, for the brand and, and build that brand. And, and look, they all love phase, but, you know, when it comes to like dollars and cents, you know, you're making money over here. So we need to incentivize them to, and make deals for them to kind of make money over here as well. Is it exclusive where they're coming to you versus one of the other top companies or how does that work? Yeah, no, it's exclusive to us. You know, the, uh, a lot of our creators uh, have brand deals and we have talent management inside uh, of FaZe Clan. Um, and so, you know, brand deals are all part of it. And the, honestly, that's part of why people get excited um, is because, you know, oh, I signed with FaZe, now bring the brands on, you know, so. Yeah, I saw <laughs> Nissan and other brands are part of this. So it's, it's pretty mainstream when you really think about it. What's that? I'm sorry. Very mainstream when you think about it. Nissan is a part of the brands that's there, you know, that G Fuel. and Well, all it, you know, uh, Matt, all of these brands are so desperate to reach this demographic and none of them really know how to do it, you know? And so it, it's true. I, I would even say the NFL has been trying to figure that out um, because it's, it's not the way that we traditionally reach audiences. You know, they're not sitting there on the television and you're, you're throwing commercials at them. Um, they're on this thing right here, you know, or they're streaming on Twitch. So, so it disarms these brands almost in terms of like, well, how do I, how do I, a, how do I reach them? And then how do I create content that resonates with them? Right. Because we all, you know, we have, I have kids, I have three kids. Honestly, when I'm looking at some of the things they're watching, we talked about yesterday, Matt, what the hell is this? You know, how can this be entertaining? I don't get it. And yet this is what they're consuming hours upon hours upon hours. And so if, if you're an advertiser or a brand, um, you know, the, the traditional method or, or creative, the traditional creative doesn't even work. You know, um, some of these kids don't even know what linear television is. So how can you possibly create something that resonates with them um, when they're completely unfamiliar with the platform that, that, that you're trying to serve on them? Um, and so we have a very concerted effort internally at phase where we've just brought in a lot of internet kids. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it really is, there, there's a fatherly kind of duty that I have to oversee some of these and say, hey, here's what we're trying to do. What do you guys think? You know, and then they go at it and, and they, and then, so we take that creative and now we kind of make, a, make it into, a, a, you know, something that's producible and that would be distributable over our channels. So because of that uniqueness, do you find that when you're in your in the C-suite with the CEO lead drink, it you it's not just the five uh, executives. It's do you bring in the content people as well? And tell me about what one of those boardroom meetings might look like. Yeah, uh, really interesting, Matt. Those, those meetings are really interesting. <laughs> um, you know, I would say that probably my boss is like 24 years old. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, <clears throat> So, but it's, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic, right? And it's not the first time that I've, <clears throat> that I've been through something like this. When I worked at GoPro, um, you know, you had a brand that was built by young people really pretty much through YouTube, right? They didn't do their first television commercial until 2014. Um, and they started probably eight years before that. So when you, when you come to a company like that, um, there's a natural resistance just from the founders, right? To the people that are like, hey man, I've, I've poured myself into this 
And now you're bringing in a guy from New York or from LA or whatever. And it's like, no, 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 I, I, we, we got this, you know, that that's the, the natural kind of reaction that you, that you get. And I understand it. You know, you, you pour yourself into something. Um, the last thing you want is the good idea fairy coming in and, and, and messing it up. Right. Um, so you taking a page out of when I joined GoPro, which was very, you know, look, I, I'm not here to overtake what you guys have done. I'm really here to embrace it and, and level it up and really kind of widen it out. Um, I think that approach that being humble enough to understand that um, and putting your ego aside uh, and saying, hey, I'm here to learn because, you know, there are things you're talking about I just don't understand. Um, I think that goes a long way. And a lot of my, my first couple of months at FaZe was really about hearts and minds and, you know, building that trust. Um, and having, you know, the, the, like I said, the humility to admit, like, I don't know everything about gaming. I don't know a lot about gaming, you know? Um, and that's okay. Um, and I think they appreciate that. And then they, they look at, you know, there are other things like leadership, um, and, and just vision that I think, you know, they want to be led. They don't, they don't know what they don't know. Um, and so when you come in and you open your mind and you're willing to learn from them, but then when you're seeing things like, okay, Hey, we need a strategy here. I, I understand what you guys are doing, but maybe this is a direction and, and it's, you really end up being like a coach, right. And you're trying to kind of inspire them, keep them motivated, keep their ideas flowing, um, on the back burner, trying to make money too. Right. I mean, trying to keep the doors open. Um, and so it's interesting. And I gotta tell you, We've uh, because I have three kids, I've got a built in R&D department. Right. So I'm asking my 10 year old all the time. Hey, you know, Tim, the tat man, who, who is this guy? And what is what is he talking about? <laughs> so um, my bosses are closer in the age to my kids than they are to me. So it, it's um, but I think there's a mutual respect when you approach situations like that. Um, I've seen guys come in really hot um, and just crash and burn. Right. And so it's just it, it's never uh, never has a good outcome. Um, and so that that's really how okay. I, I try to approach my day to day. Well, that's great. So when you're sitting around there and you alluded to it a little bit, you can you mentioned a few nicknames already. Everyone has you got your guy Banks, you know, you got temper. Yeah, you got it. You have to have a nickname. Tell us what your nickname is. And what I really want to know is how did you get it and when did you get it? <laughs> so they call me the Godfather, um, which <laughs> is great. Um, and I think, you know, again, why they call me that, obviously I'm like twice everybody's age there. Um, and they would just come to me and say, hey, can we do this? Or, hey, we need you to do that. And I'm able to make things happen, you know? So I guess it's very, very Don Corleone-like uh, where I'm just making things happen to them. Um, but it's great, it's a good relationship. And I, I, I love it because, um, you know, they, they have started to look to me for guidance and advice in, in other areas too, because, you know, they'll be the, uh, I'm the first to admit, I don't know a, a great deal about gaming. Well, they don't know a great deal about business either, you know, and like how to, how to lead a group or how to manage or do any of those things. So, you know, we've had really good conversations where um, they'll be candid with me and say, Hey, look, I, we've never built an org chart. How do we do that? <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, well, that, that's easy. And we do that. And I'll say, well, you know, what is a no scope kill? <laughs> that's my question to them. You know, And then they'll tell me, so you just have to have that exchange of, of knowledge. And I think that that's, uh, that's really what I, the dynamic I try to set up at, as the godfather. <laughs> sure. So are you, as the godfather, are you allowed into that Burbank, uh, the house that they have, the, the content house? Yeah, I've been there a few times. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been there a few times. Now we're in the process of, of that house is broken up and we've got a house in Vegas now. Um, okay. We're working on another house in LA. We just signed um, a group called Nuke Squad and we're looking for a house for them in LA. So now we may have four houses by, uh, by midsummer. So um, yeah. Well, good luck and stay out, of, stay out of harm's way in those places. Yeah, yeah. Believe me, every time I have to go to the house, my kids are like, can I go? Can I come and meet Banks? Or can I come and meet Apex? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, to bring it back to the, the more serious side of business, tell us about a time or even with your, your coworkers or your, the content creators there where you really had to take a big risk and maybe mix things up, whether it was going to phase in the first place or even going to California or making yeah. yourself vulnerable with everyone that's there. Tell us a little bit about some of those situations. 
Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, just uh, if you look at my career uh, as a whole, I think there are, are a bunch of moments where I've taken risks. And, and I think for me, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not the house cat type. Like I can't curl up for 15 years at a place and just kind of be happy. You know, I, I always have to feel like I, I'm moving forward. Um, and so I started out in live television, you know, uh, I started out actually at QVC in Pennsylvania. Um, and I worked there for a while, um, worked my way up to a director and then left uh, and went to New York. Um, and I was, uh, I worked for Sports Channel where I was pretty much, they had a startup network called New Sport. I directed a, a talk show or a two hour live talk show called New Sport Talk and then directed everything else that they had. Um, uh, QVC had called me up about two years into that, said they wanted me to come back as a director of operations, um, which I did. I went back, I left New York, but I still had that New York bug in me. And while I was up in New York, um, yeah, I tried to do everything that I could, right? I worked on Guiding Light. I worked in the city doing uh, anything that I could do. Um, and at, this, at that time, I, I was directing uh, at the Sports Network, and I didn't have anybody to edit for me. And so editing, you know, really, I'm a, I'm a musician. So I've been a musician since I've been two years old, still trying to be a rock star. You know, it, I'm not giving that dream up. Um, but part of that was like, you know, with four tracks. And so you're recording and you're editing, you're doing all that stuff. Um, and uh, when I was at Sports Channel New York, I didn't have any editors. And I said, well, send me to edit school. Let me just learn the, the control, of it, you know? And, and I did, and I fell in love with it. And so... Um, I made some connections up in New York. And when I went back to Philadelphia for QVC, I just got really bored. And um, HBO had called me and said, you know, I had been talking with them about an edit position. And so they had said, hey, we have a, a spot open, which we'd love for you to come up. And so at that point, I, I was a director in a corporation. You know, I had 75 people reporting to me. And here I am with an opportunity to go back to New York and be the night editor at HBO Studios. And so that was like the first time where I'm like, oh, OK, um, I got a nice office at QVC. I, you know, I'm like in management or am I going to go and, and just kind of take the leap and be a nighttime editor uh, for HBO? And, and look, uh, this is the advice that I still give to people is you got to follow your heart, you know, and, and that's I'm a, I'm a gut guy, you know. And so my gut was just like I, I just couldn't see not going back to New York and taking that opportunity. And, and luckily I did, you know, it was like, I could have stayed at QVC and gone more of the management route and done that. But uh, I chose to take a risk and go to HBO. And pretty quickly, I worked my way up to be like really the number one editor there. I was editing uh, the Chris Rock show, Inside the NFL, Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, um, Sopranos campaigns, all of these things that I never would have gotten the opportunity to had I stayed at QVC. Um, and so, it was at that point uh, they said, well, hey, we want you to, uh, to cut a documentary uh, on Howard Cosell. Great. I, I watched Howard growing up. This is like, you know, I, I played football at Susquehanna. This is the closest thing I can get to the NFL is like editing a documentary about Howard Cosell. So I'm like, I'm in. I love it. And I fell in love with documentaries. Right. And that was really the first one that I had done. And that was in the fall by the spring, uh, I got an email. I, you know, I don't even think I got an email. I think it was somebody came because it was prior to emails, right? And they said, well, you were nominated for an Emmy. I said, for what? For editing the Howard Cosell documentary. Uh, I had no idea that was even possible, right? So I'm like, all right. So I got invited to the Marriott Marquis in New York City, um, you know, uh, for, for the Emmy Awards. And I ended up winning. <laughs> and I have to say, I was probably four Heinekens in when I went up on stage to kind of accept it. But um, but that was like a moment for me where I was just like floored. I, I, I couldn't believe I won. And, and that's, so again, risk that, you know, you've taken a risk that, that pays off in, in, in an unforeseen way. That really was the catalyst to the rest of my career, because from there, um, once that happened, um, you know, I, I bought an Avid in my Midtown apartment and I started a little side business and I built it up to the point where, it was a year later where I left HBO and people were like, what, you're crazy. I'm like, again, I just, I just have to do this. If I don't do it now, I'm going to wake up 20 years from now and be like, damn, I wish I would have done that, you know? And so I did it and I grew that one 
you know, I had one Avid in my studio apartment of 900 square feet, and I grew that into 10,000 square feet, five edit rooms, two Pro Tools rooms, and a music company, and a, a production company that, that was winning Emmys and tellies and cable aces and all that stuff. Um, and so again, another example of a risk um, that, you know, uh, that I just wanted to take, you know, and, and fortunately it paid off. Now, 2008 came and the world collapsed and the business model was like, what was crazy. Um, and so I was working on a film for HBO, the, the Lombardi film, and um, I, their creative director had left. Long story short, they had offered me to come back and, and be the creative director for HBO Sports, which I, I took. Um, it was, again, you know, at that point I had three kids. So the freelance and having your own company was great when you're a little younger and you don't have kids, but you know, it's a little bit uh, nerve wracking, especially on the heels of that 2008 financial collapse, right? Because everything was just, all the models were all over the place. Um, so I worked at HBO um, there, uh, built that kind of department up, rebranded HBO sports, uh, their boxing uh, series, all of that stuff, 24-7. Uh, Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, ended up directing Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. Um, and so I was five years in and uh, I get a, uh, a LinkedIn message from GoPro Entertainment. Hey, we, we've seen your work, you know, would you be interested in, in coming to GoPro and helping us start this entertainment unit? So, uh, you know, and it was in California, but I've always wanted to be California. It's something in me, I don't know. I just wanted to oh, sorry, live yeah. in, yeah, I just wanted to live in California, you know? Um, and so I said to my wife and my kids, I said, what do you think about this, right? And, um, and luckily, you know, I'm blessed to have a very supportive wife and kids and they're like, let's go. And so again, another moment in my career where everybody's like, you're gonna leave HBO, like you're directing this and you're doing all these things. I'm like, yeah, but you know, I just feel like this is the future. This is where it's going, you know? And like, ironically, like we said, Matt, that, you know, five years later, HBO Sports is disbanded, it doesn't even exist. So had I stayed there, you know, for the security, I probably would have been out of a job, you know? But, uh, but I, I chose to kind of go to GoPro and I was really thrown into the bowels of Silicon Valley and digital media, you know? And again, I was in a very uncomfortable position of being in a company where, you know, they're talking about things that I had never heard of. Um, and, and I'm in a leadership position. Um, but it was really a, an education, not only in digital media, but just in, in how to deal with people. I think that all kind of led up to my phase, uh, uh, you know, where I am now. Um, yeah. But again, another part where I just took a risk um, you know, to, to hopefully make it pay off. Um, you know, the GoPro thing was interesting because it's probably the Harvard Business School case of what not to do. Um, they, it really was about a two year run. They took their eye off the ball on the camera business and at the same time realized that, oh, entertainment's expensive. <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. So um, I left there and that's when I went to the NFL. I moved to LA. Um, the NFL was something I had done a lot of projects with the NFL. Like I said, I did inside the NFL. I, I uh, did the Lombardi documentary. I did the Namath documentary. Um, I've done just a ton of work with the NFL over the years. So uh, it was a natural fit. Um, and, uh, you know, it was great. I was VP of, of creative across all advertising and marketing and promotion for NFL media. Um, and then that was about, uh, about two years. And then I transitioned to be head of development in the content side. Um, and so that was all going great. And then again, here comes phase clamp, <laughs> you know, and, and we'll see if this pays off. I'm only five months into it, but, uh, I did leave the mothership of the NFL, um, to get into an industry that I feel like is going to explode, you know, um, within, in, in the next five to 10 years. And so again, we'll see how this story ends, but, um, it, for me, it's just, it, it, it's what keeps me going. It's, it's more for the soul. It, it inspires me. Um, it keeps me interested. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's a little bit about, you know, some examples of risks throughout my career. I uh, appreciate that. That's uh, awesome. Great. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, good personal stuff too. And I, I'm sure a lot of that uh, risk taking, you know, is uh, starts out from the great Susquehanna education that we had. So, you know, you absolutely experience <laughs> those things for sure. Well, you just give us a little bit of your evolution in your career. And we're, we're talking about evolution of content. You're somewhat of a visionary, I would say. Tell me a little bit about how you think you might be able to marry 
what you're doing now into maybe a new opportunity like the NCAA name, image, and likeness type of uh, new things that are coming out for those players? Is there a possibility where you guys are already thinking about that? Or how could something like that help even, you know, further accelerate your growth? Yeah, well, I mean, when, when you talk about the change uh, to, to content, right? I, I mean, I think it's it's really interesting. It's um, I always look at, and for some reason, I go back to like, you know, we used to listen to LPs, right? Go to the story, buy our, our, those albums or 45s, and then all of a sudden cassettes came on, right? And then then it was CDs, and then it's DVD, and, you know, now it's streaming. And But at the end of the day, it's like we're listening to songs, right? Like all of that stuff is just delivery mechanisms, right? And it's just about, and so I, I feel like the same thing is with story, right? Like no matter what the form is, people just are interested in good stories, um, and you look at how content and, and platforms and distribution have, has evolved over the years. And probably um, in the last five years, it's evolved more than it has in the last you know, 50 years. The pace at which you see new platforms pop up, um, you see um, everybody is now pivoting to these direct to consumer uh, models because you just don't need them. Before it was ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS and, and maybe a couple of UHF channels, right? And that was it. And you have um, remote control. That's it, right? You can turn the dial on the TV there. And now uh, there are so many platforms and ways to get content. And I was at a, a, a creative meeting yesterday. You know, these kids are just saying they're, they're not even paying for content. They said, we will never pay for content. And because they can find it wherever they want. And yet, I'm spending like a hundred bucks a week on Fortnite skins, you know? So they won't pay for content, but they'll pay for like these micro transactions and games. Um, it still costs me money. Um, but, it, but it's just, it, it just is indicative of, of how our behaviors have changed. Right. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting when you look at, at GoPro, when I first got there, we had a, a whole campaign about, um, we had a new camera. It was a little session camera, a square camera. And um, the campaign was we put a, a, a session camera next to a smartphone, right? And then we pelted, like we shot paintballs at it. We threw snowballs. We poured like beer over it. And the point was that the, the, the session was indestructible and the phone eventually fell over. Not such a smart strategy for GoPro, right? Because what needed to happen was we needed to embrace this because guess what? Everybody's got this. And this turned out that the, the, the GoPro camera was a very niche market. So the point is, is that, you know, the, the smartphone has changed our behavior and, and consumption patterns um, to the point where uh, content, the way you create content, you know, um, when you're looking at, uh, YouTube as a platform, you know, there are ways editing has evolved to the point where you're editing for the algorithm, because that's how you get into recommended, uh, into recommended videos. That's how you start to gain momentum. Um, and it, it's really about, uh, okay, we got to pull up all of these breaths in here so that you see a lot of jump cuts and that's purposely done because it drives the algorithm you know, or thumbnails and all of these things that were never possible before because of the digital capacity and the throughput that we have and the technology that we have, even identifying audiences, right? We can tell who watched it, how long they watched it, at what point did they dip out, you know? Oh, and we also have their, hopefully they authenticated. So we have their, their email in a database that we can market to and use to, to optimize content. So the whole game has changed from Nielsen ratings, which is probably one of the biggest kind of, you know, not scam, but like illusions of all um, to now really pinpoint specific data uh, about consumption and behavior um, that you can monetize and also optimize, right? So because of that technology, we're able to put out on social media, we can put an A version of an ad and a B version of an ad. And we say, oh, this one's getting more traction. So we're, we're going to ditch that. And in real time, you're optimizing content, right? And, um, that's the other thing I guess we should just talk about content, right? It's probably the most overused word in the world. And sometimes I even get confused as what's content, you know, what is content? Well, there's stills that are content. There's conversations that are content. There's tweets that are content. There's copy that's content. Everything now is content. And it's really the universal language, right? It's how we advertise. It's how we communicate. Um, it, it, it's really, this is the golden age of content because it's not just shows anymore. 
right? It's content is, uh, is kind of ubiquitous across all platforms in all sorts of formats and uh, all sorts of flavors. So when you hear about content today, um, I think it's not the same content that we grew up with. Right. So when you talk about content, we, we had a great question from uh, John Folson, our uh, viewing audience, <laughs> if you will. He talks about, you know, how, how do we um, edit to the, an algorithm? You know, how do we learn how to do that? How can we, what should we be teaching our Susquehanna students um, and to help prepare them in this new media world? What, what do you suggest and, and how, we, how do we, you know, educate for content? What, give, us, uh, give us some tips to keep Susquehanna at the top of the list. Well, it's a great question, and I wish I knew how the hell they did the algorithm, but I think the, those companies purposely keep it close to the vest because they don't want you to find out. You know, I don't even think Netflix puts out uh, analytics on, on, on their shows on consumption or anything like that. So it's very proprietary to these media companies, um, and it's very valuable. I, I would say this, man, you know, I, I think that being, you know, the new word is being a creator. Right. I think that is what this youth culture is about. And you used to have you used to have talent, you know, that was on camera. And then you used to have the creators, whether they're the writers, producers, directors. Now the talent is the creator. Right. That that's what it is. And so you see it's 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 amazing because the, the youth today are so deal savvy and so like, you know, they're hustlers and Man, I could just imagine if I said some of the things they said to me at HBO, HBO, be like, take a hike, man, you know, but these kids are wanting points and like, hey, an EP fee and like, you know, all of these things that are like, just so foreign to, to how we came up in the business. Um, but they're super smart. They understand what community is, right. And being that creator now being that editor being that artist that designer is considered talent. You know, and that's that's what's kind of rising uh, above um, and, and standing out. And so that's when I go back to phase. It's like to think about we're building a, 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 a company that is made up of creators is really exciting. And I feel like it's on the forefront. So you know, I, I talk to a lot of young people. Um, you know, I, obviously, I'm an editor at heart, editor, director. Um but when you talk about Emmys, you know, and I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just saying this to, 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 to make a point, you know, I've won an Emmy as a director, as an editor, as a composer, as a creative director, and as a producer. And back in the day, that was really kind of unique, right? Today, I would say it's probably commonplace, you know, that these kids are able to do everything um, because they understand and they've grown up with, with that skill set and this equipment um, and the tools to be able to do that. And I think storytelling there it's just much more accessible right like when garage band came out before garage band like i said you had four tracks it's it's a very small subset of people who would be willing to just do, go and you know push buttons and do four track but garage band came out and it's like wow man we can make and now everybody's a composer right and so you know with that you get a lot of bad music but you also get a lot of opportunity and um and product that you never would have had you not had that uh, evolution in technology. Um, and so just being a creator today, um, I, I think is a whole different ball game. And, and that's what I talk to, to kids about is like, you know, well, are you just an editor? Well, you should be shooting too, because if you're shooting, it makes you a better editor. And it also, if you're editing, it makes you a better shooter, you know? Understanding how to uh, work with After Effects, understanding Photoshop, under, which really Photoshop today is kind of like, you know, it's like a typewriter for these kids. If you don't know Photoshop, it's a, it's a, it's part of their their everyday uh, menu of things and tools that they use. Um, and, and so I think it, it's also becoming niche at the same time, right? So you've got uh, platforms that emerge like Twitch, and so you know it's really a streaming platform. Um, it was streaming games, but when you look at these streamers who are now becoming really huge, um, they're creators in their own right. Yes, they're playing games, but you have a guy like Nick Merckx who streams to 75,000 people every day, or, you know, like two weeks ago, almost a half a million people. And before he even starts to play a game, Nick is talking about what happened the night before in, in the heat game or, that is Detroit Lions fan. And so I look at it as like, oh, this is the modern day radio, 
right? These, these guys are personalities. It's not just about gameplay. Yeah, some of it's about gameplay, but um, you know, one of the, the, the things that sticks with me that the streamer said is like, the key to being a good streamer is having a good team around you so that you don't get killed. Because as long as you're keeping the game going, the show's going, right? And so I'll take Nick Merckx and in the morning, I'll just kind of put him on in the background and I'll just listen to him do whatever he's doing, you know? And I'm not really paying attention to the game, but it, it's it's that kind of, it's that new form of entertainment, it, which is really, to me, harkens back to the radio days. Um, even the podcast, when you look at like scripted podcasts, you know, I was just at a meeting yesterday. I'm like, well, that's some Orson Welles stuff, man. I mean, <laughs> it's come full circle that we're now doing live podcast, which is like what RKO was, right? So, you know, I guess everything old is new again, but, um, but now we have a direct line to the consumer and to the audience. I don't need NBC. I don't need CBS. I don't even need HBO. I can go start a YouTube channel and I can reach a massive audience or I can start on Twitch and reach a massive audience. And I think that middleman is what is, it has been replaced and is why you see this direct to consumer model so attractive because um, companies want to monetize that fandom. Sure. Absolutely. I see it even in, you know, tonight's the NFL draft, right? So the New York giants have their own digital platform where they don't care if you watch the draft, they have current players on there. They have celebrities. They have people who are celebrity fans. They have, you know, other weird off beaten path things happening on their app, their app. That's right. They don't even, they're trying to promote, just go to, go, go to us. And we'll give you a, I don't know, free soda or something. You know? That's <laughs> it's, right. It's no, it's exactly crazy. right. It's, it's about engaging that fan base, right? And communicating and having a dialogue with that fan base. Absolutely right. right. Now, is, with the draft being tonight, do you guys have a uh, your own content where you're trying to use that to help something? What's your platform for that tonight? So, uh, yeah. So we actually, this whole week we've been, we partnered with the NFL. Um, and I guess, can I, can I share my screen here? Yeah, um, sure. yeah. Let, let me, let me do that real quick. Um, Cause I have something that, that I think would be interesting for everybody to see. Um, now I know that there's like an optimized for video. Here you go. Optimized for video clip. There we go. It looks like Nashville to me. It, yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> um, but I think that this is, this is what we dropped on, uh, on Monday. Okay. To kick off our partnership um, with draft week. So it's a minute long. It may be choppy. I'm not sure what my bandwidth is like, but, but you'll get the idea. Okay. Let us go to the commissioner. With the first pick in the NFL draft. You live? We're good. Yo, am I tripping or is that Banks? What? Yeah, 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 yeah. On the TV, Listen, bro. On the no, TV. No way, bro. That's definitely yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mr. Commissioner. Had the mods hack the stream, turning this into the phase draft. And with the first pick of the draft, phase clan selects Kyler Murray, baby. Let's go! Kyler Murray, just the king. So I grew up playing video games my whole life. So to be drafted by phase, be a part of the family, it's a blessing, it's an honor. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that was, you know, um, we, uh, Kyler's a gamer. He, uh, we, th we said, Hey man, it's draft week. What better time to announce Kyler than on draft week? He's our number one pick. Um, and so we made that partnership. And so that was on Monday. Um, you know, got tremendous pickup all over the place. Uh, everybody from Bleacher Report, ESPN to Forbes. Um, and then so uh, we continued to put out content on our um, Instagram story channel. Um, that was shared by the NFL. That was shared by Kyler Murray. It was shared by the Arizona Cardinals. And so we've just kept that story going and going. And you mentioned Draftathon, Matt. And so we've got uh, two of our guys on, uh, actually three of our guys, Nick Merckx, Nate Hill and Swag are going to be on the Draftathon tonight, um, uh, talking with Kay and uh, and Deion Sanders about gaming and and, and actually mental health. So, right. it was a good moment. Um, I think that the industry really kind of recognized it as a moment in gaming where you know a brand like the NFL um, recognizes you know gaming you know and and for us 
um, looking at the gaming community, um, welcoming somebody like Kyler into the family. Um, it's just a, a really, really big moment. Oh, absolutely. That was tremendous to see and how it all uh, pulls it all together. You know, you already had Bronny out there. From, uh, got Bronny, yeah, we've got Bronny. We've got Ben Simmons. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So but, you know, you only get you don't not often you get a number one draft pick NFL quarterback. That, that's a that's a moment. <clears throat> That is a moment. Yeah, yeah. even the uh, Jag Jaguars haven't gotten that yet. They got to wait another 15 minutes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, great. Um, we had another question pop up here. Uh, the question is from uh, Luke Watson. He asks, do your individual players push back on promoting the company's owned channels versus their personal channels? And how do you manage or leverage their um, instinct for personal promotion, you know, to help benefit the organization? Yeah, it's a great question. It's not, it's not as much pushback as it is like, well, I'm making a lot of money over here on my channel, you know? And so, um, look, different members have different deals, um, but, it, it, you know, it, we make a point to incentivize them. And I think that they know that, you know, look, there's also different kind of uh, members. So you've got more of the OG, more established members, right, who have their, their monetization on their channels. Um, and, but everybody knows that in, in order for this to really kind of sustain it's the brand has to be, has to live, right? So it's not just about an individual. Um, you need to kind of build that brand. Of course, the newer members are just so excited to be phase, uh, in the phase kind of ecosystem. And they're a lot more willing to do things. Um, but even you look at the founders now, as they get a little bit older and they, the business sense starts to come into them and say, yeah, you know, it's not really about us anymore. We need to kind of lean into the younger crowd and make sure that they have the same platform and that that brand stands up. So I'm not going to say it's easy because I think that that's a constant, uh, uh, conversation that we have, um, because brands come in, we are able to, uh, compensate them in some sort of ways depends on the initiative too. Some, some they're just totally behind like th this Kyler initiative, everybody was behind. So it was really easy to get guys to do something like that. Pretty neat. That's, uh, that's great. You know, I mean, of course, you know, we have the famous orange and maroon brand and we're able to promote that next week during the orange maroon days. Yep. Tell us about phase and your, your colors and your cool logo. And, and does that resonate with that with that, not only that group, but beyond the group of gamers and influencers? Well, I would say beyond the game of, beyond the group of gamers and influencers, you know, look, we've got work to do to really kind of become mainstream, right? I think that, like you said, you didn't know who we were. I, I, I think there's a, there, there's a threshold in, in age where you know, if you're that age, you probably don't know who the hell phase is. Um, but once you're, you know, uh, again, once you're in, in this, you know, probably our, our sweet spot of fan is probably between 12 and 18, right? Like that's where a, a majority of our fans live. Um, as you know, the founders get older and, and you're starting to, to see it creep up between 18 and 25. Um, and there is that contingent of, of 30 plus gamers, right? It's just gamers who are older, who do know uh, who, what phase clan is, but you know, uh, if I can do this, this is, uh, you know, this is the phase logo. So this is phase up, right? So you see all these guys doing phase up um, and our logo, um, you know, we give our logo out to our guys. So when they're streaming, that's part of the marketing power. You know, you're seeing the phase logo there and that's how all the content they create then gets associated with phase. And that's kind of how you keep the machine going, right? Uh, it's not all about just that phase channel. Um, like I said, when you look at our phase channel, we have about 8 million subscribers to our YouTube channel. When you look at uh, all of our creators combined, you know, you're well over 340, 350 million. Right. So um, that individual piece of it is, is a significant part in, in keeping that brand and, and growing. Now, when we look at activations like the NFL, the main purpose of that is to grow it, right? And so you'll see some of the comments on the NFL page were like, who the hell is phase? What is this going, you know? And then you'll see the same thing about Kyler in the gaming, right? But I think the win is, is that you're cross-pollinating, right? You're exposing it to a different audience. You're exposing Kyler to a different audience. And that's how you start to really grow. At the same time, you have to make sure that you're true and authentic to your core, but you also want to kind of level up and start to grow that brand to, uh, to, to reach different audiences. 
Great. Well, thanks for not making me feel bad about not knowing it, but you know, <laughs> my maturity level is about a 13 to 18 year old. So <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to show you how old I am. I got to put my glasses on to read this next question though. This next question comes in uh, from Zach. He said, thoughts on the newly announced esports certificate. Do you think that it will limit the ability for people to enter the realm of esports and content creation? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what the announcement of the esports certificate is. Well, I don't so, either. Yeah. <laughs> if, Zach, uh, uh, if Zach wants to uh, chat one more time and tell me what it's about, we'll certainly yeah. get a, a follow-up answer from Bill. And that's also a good good point to anyone who has any questions. You can use the chat feature or the the Q and A and just fill in there. We have you know a few minutes left where Bill will be happy to answer questions and uh, let us know if you, you have any. Hey, Bill, John uh, Fultz did ask, um, he said, what are some of the tools that today's creators are using and what are you seeing um, at, at Faz? Uh, what, he, he's thinking about for our students, what, uh, what tools should they be thinking about and, and working on? Yeah, I mean, look, Premiere is, is a, a workhorse. Premiere is the Adobe Premiere is the edit software that a lot of people use, um, even more than Avid. Um, so, um, Premiere, obviously Photoshop, After Effects, um, you know, those are still some of the key, uh, tools out there, um, from a, just from a communication platform, like discord is a very big gaming community. Um, uh, Twitch is another platform. Um, you know, but in terms of the content creation, um, it, it really hasn't changed. It's, it's crazy. It's really about shooting and editing, you know? Um, I think stylistically and just distribution has changed a lot. But, um, you know, and, and of course, those, those, uh, that software evolves as well, right? So the things that you can do in Premiere now, um, the plugins that you have, the effects that you have are, are, are great. Um, but it, that's really what a, a bulk of our guys use. You know, the real engine, 3D, um, the software, all of that stuff is amazing. And some of our guys, um, by using Real Engine, which is a gaming engine to create graphics, some of the promos that they're able to crank out in a 3D world, it, it's just like, you know, would, would probably have cost millions of dollars, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you could even do it. And now they're cranking it out in a weekend. So I think the, the computing power, the, the uh, graphic cards, all of that has just um, really gotten to a really robust point. Cool. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate you answering that. So we did get a follow up from Zach on the esports certificate. So it's the esports certificate. It's more or less like an SAT type test for those looking to enter positions within esports organizations. The current huh. test is four hundred dollars to take and pass, but doesn't guarantee them a spot within an organization. Huh. Yeah, uh, I, honestly, I, I have I have no idea. Um, you know, with our esports, we have a whole esports division, and we go out and recruit. You know, and the and the way that we recruit is is by watching kids online, um, watching them play. You know, who who's who's getting the buzz? Um, and so we're global. We've got you know teams in Brazil. Um, you know, CS:GO servers are in Eastern Europe, so we've got uh, a lot of our guys out there. Um, but it's a, a, a lot of our recruitment and the way we identify um, esports players is through our guys. You know, they, they know oh, this guy's sick or that guy's amazing and, and they go after him that way. Sure. That's how we do it. I, I can't speak to how other organizations do it. Great. Thank you for answering that. There's another good question asked about gambling. So oh. are esports legal to be gambling on? And if so, as do you see that's going to rise tremendously or do you think it's going to become legal soon? So I think the, the legality is state to state still, right? Um, I think it depends on what state you're in. Um, but I mean, heck yeah. I mean, like legalized sports betting. I mean, geez, when I was at the NFL, it was, you know, for a long time, it was taboo. But, you know, now you're seeing partnerships with draft games, you know, and FanDuel. And so it's coming. I mean, it, it's certainly on the horizon. Um, and I would just say, looking at, at how popular it is, it, yeah, I, I would imagine that it makes its way into gaming in, in a really robust, um, because it's all about gamifying, right? Like that's that whole culture is gamifying. And so when you look at how gambling has evolved um, through DraftKings or FanDuel and how they gamify it, 
um, and all the prop bets that you can make, all of that stuff. It's like those worlds are, are definitely, uh, you know, colliding. So we're not, we haven't had those discussions yet, but I can't imagine that it's not right around the corner. Awesome. Yeah, I, I can believe it too. I'll tell you, the, the gambling made the NFL even more popular and it'll probably do the same thing for the gaming. And we yep. had another great question that kind of segues into some of your gaming. And it's the idea that, you know, um, do you feel like taking the, the clan more mainstream has hurt some of your, you know, the gravitas of, in the core demographic that you have, you know, when like, you know, for instance, Facebook is now toxic to the young medium uh, age yep. folks. 100%. Like, I think that's the risk, uh, whatever brand you have, right? Um, it, it's like, how can you grow it without upsetting the core? Um, and, and so we talk about this all the time, because it's something that when we look at our YouTube page, right, right now, our YouTube page is very, very much focused on, on the Vegas house, right? And so, you know, I look at it as like, oh, well, um, I'm watching Friends, you know, it's, I'm watching Friends on here. And if you put Everybody Loves Raymond on there, I'm going to be pissed, right? I don't want to, I want Friends. So, but from an organization standpoint, it's like, well, that Vegas house isn't just the only representation of what phases, right? We've got 80 members in here and we're only focusing on five. So how do you grow the brand and still main, remain true to the core fan base, which I think is is kind of standard across any sort of uh, uh, a brand, um, you know, growth or, or consideration. Same thing at the NFL, right? I mean, when you're looking at the NFL, the NFL has so many different, you know, 189 million fans across the, the country. Um, and those fans are all made up of, you know, different, different kind of ethos and, and ideology. And, and really when, when you're looking at, it, it, it's a great point. I lived through the Kaepernick, um, you know, era uh, of, of the NFL, and it was really a, a, a huge problem, right? Because when you look at leagues like the NBA, which tend to be a little bit more blue and progressive, um, you look at like NASCAR, which tends to be a little bit more rev, red and conservative. And then you look at the NFL, which is probably 10x all of those audiences and has just as much red as blue. So how do you pick a side on that, right? You, you, any decision you make is going to alienate one side or the other. Um, and so I think the same holds true. And even as Kyler Murray, thing, it's like a debate on, you know, do, do we really lean into it? Because the purists are going to be like, oh, you know, and we, you saw some of those comments, right? Oh, they're just signing celebrities, right? But the trade-off is, yes, you may kind of uh, agitate some of those core fans, but at the same time, now you're also getting Kyler Murray fans. So it's that constant, like, that not churn, but like the, 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 the balance of staying true to the core, but also allowing the brand to grow, right? And grow because you're gaining other audiences, but still maintaining that essence of, of what that core is. Perfect. Great question. Yeah. And not an easy our time. Um, um, and I think we've got one more question. I'm, I wanna make sure uh, we get everybody's questions. And uh, so, yeah, so one more question. Yeah, there's one more question here. We certainly, you know, everyone wants to respect Bill's time and appreciate him coming for sure. And it's been awesome, quite frankly. <laughs> it's been a great conversation, very enlightening. And that whole world has got a, a long way to go. So uh, yeah. one more question here comes in from Luke asks, you know, what interests or industries do you find overlap or intersect most naturally with gaming? For example, maybe the sneaker culture or cannabis, comedy. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think <laughs> it's, it's all of those, right? Because it, it, the gaming, again, it, it's the common denominator, right? It's what this, this, this generation is doing. No matter what your other interests are, it always comes back to gaming because even through the pandemic, you know, looking at how my kids socialized with others, it was through game. Like you take their game away and they're not talking to their friends. Um, even, you know, now as things open up, they're still on for four or five hours talking to their friends, but it goes back to our early conversation about like, this is the social currency. This is, you know, a buddy of mine, um, said he had to, he had to learn how to play uh, world of Warcraft. Uh, otherwise he would have lost his friends. You know, and so I think that gaming is this you'll see this gaming culture. It's more about youth culture. Right. And so you'll have different different areas of youth culture, um, whether it's fashion or music. But um, gaming is going to be the, the, the common factor that lies beneath all of these things. So great question, though. 
pretty cool. Well, Bill, let me uh, say uh, personally, it's been great to get to know you over the last few days of us talking. And it's kind of interesting where we were, we were on campus at the same time, knew a few similar people, but never really got a chance to know each other. Right. So it was a great opportunity to reconnect. And then as you celebrate your 30th and my 29th in October, I hope to see you and the other 50 or plus alumni on the, the call here at back on campus for the yeah. homecoming. Looking forward Absolutely. to doing that in person and it'll be a great time. That, that maybe, would be uh, great. Maybe the Flames could come out and play for us. Oh, then now you're talking my language, man. Yeah, <laughs> that, that sounds great. Matt, thank you so much. It was great to get to know you. I really enjoyed our past few days. Um, absolutely, we'll look for you uh, at homecoming. Devin, thank you for setting this up. I, I can't tell you, I always love to kind of give back as much as I can to Susquehanna. Um, I wish I could see everybody's face out there. I appreciate you listening to me um, and, uh, and and taking an interest in this. And, and I would just say, hey, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm always open open to have conversations. And uh, I know if any of your kids want an internship at FaZe, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm <laughs> sure I get like inundated with like emails and phone calls. But seriously, this is great. I, I, I love reconnecting with Susquehanna. I, I take pride in, in going there. And uh, in so many ways, it, it really has led me to where I am today uh, in unforeseen ways. So I appreciate it. I'm very thankful for, uh, for you, Devin, for you, Matt, and for everybody who's listening. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Bill. Devin, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great Absolutely. Night. Thank Have you, everybody. Night. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great night.